Hey guys, this is Vadim with Max Tech, and as you can tell from my voice, I'm just a little bit sick, but this video is important for you guys, so let's get right into it. We spent basically an entire month with all three of Apple's new M1 Macs, including the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, and the Mac Mini. In fact, we've made 17 videos on these Macs since their release, so we definitely have a lot of experience with them. And while we're extremely impressed with the new M1 chip, there are definitely some problems with these new Apple Silicon Macs. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the top 10 problems that we've personally experienced, some of which we haven't heard of or seen before we ran into them ourselves. And at the end, I'll tell you if it's still worth buying one of these M1 Macs despite these problems. Getting right into it, the first problem has to do with external display support. As you already know, you can only hook up one display using Thunderbolt to these M1 Macs unless you use special adapters and software. And while Apple says that they support up to 6K resolution at 60 Hz, we had some issues with our 6K Pro Display XDR. Mostly everything runs fine, but opening up the launch pad leads to a lot of stuttering and drop frames basically every time, and I tried it with both the M1 Mac Mini and the MacBook Pro. Now I'm not sure if this is due to some software issues with macOS Big Sur, but I ended up trying it again on the $1300 base Intel 2020 MacBook Pro, and it worked perfectly, so it definitely shouldn't be happening on these M1 Macs. Moving on to problem number two, while we were expecting the lower end MacBooks to only have two Thunderbolt ports, we thought that the Mac Mini would come with four, and so far it's been causing problems because we're already using one of those ports to connect to the display. On top of that, the Mac Mini doesn't have any SD card slots, so we like to use this high-speed UHS-2 dual SD card reader, which connects using USB-C, so that takes up the second port. And because of that, we have to constantly unplug that card reader to connect something else, like one of our high-speed Thunderbolt SSDs for transferring data, so having four ports would have been really nice. Thankfully, the folks over at OWC found out that each of those Thunderbolt ports on the new M1 Mac Mini actually has its own controller, which apparently support Thunderbolt 4, so each port can actually support two extra Thunderbolt ports using their brand new OWC Thunderbolt Hub. So as you can see, you can turn one port into three, with the possibility of having a total of six Thunderbolt ports on the M1 Max if you buy two of those hubs but they do require DC power, so it makes much more sense on the stationary Mac Mini. But interestingly, OWC says that this hub supplies up to 60 watts of power, so you can just replace your MacBook's power adapter with this hub if you need the extra ports. We'll leave a link to that hub down in the description below, and by the way, we already pre-ordered one of them, and we'll be testing it in depth for our full M1 Mac Mini review, so subscribe right now if you haven't already. Moving on to problem number three, one of our viewers reached out about USB issues on the Mac Mini, specifically with them being slower than they are on the previous Intel models. We ended up doing a bunch of disk speed test benchmarking, including transferring files to and from a USB 3 SSD, and we found that yes, in fact, USB 3 is slower on the M1 Max compared to the old Intel versions. We even tested out our dual SD card reader and files transferred noticeably slower, which is very annoying. I'm not sure if this is also a software issue or if Apple chose to give less bandwidth to specifically USB 3.1 for some reason, but someone did test out an OWC Thunderbolt dock and they were able to get the full speed from their USB 3.1 SSD compared to plugging it in directly into the Mac Mini. So it's nice to see that these Thunderbolt docks solve two problems at once. Now moving on to problem number four, while Final Cut Pro performance is absolutely incredible on these M1 Macs, 
even beating out our $15,000 Mac Pro in certain scenarios, there is one major problem with video editing. We like to use Motion VFX plugins, and unfortunately, some of them don't work with Apple Silicon. Specifically, plugins like M Callouts, which can track objects and add floating titles, don't seem to work on M1 Max. Now, it could be because of the automatic tracker, which uses the old Mocha engine. Maybe that's outdated and not supported by Apple Silicon. Motion VFX did come out with a brand new tracker with a new engine that is compatible with Apple Silicon, but they're charging $300 for the plugin bundle, which is quite pricey for most people. So this is definitely a problem for people who are using the older plugins that can't get updated. Getting into problem number five, while Apple's video encoders in the M1 Max are incredibly fast, outperforming Intel's encoders, some users have reported that the video quality is actually noticeably worse. Encoding basically happens when you export a video after editing it, leaving you with your final finished video file. That file seems to have worse quality after being encoded on an M1 Mac compared to an Intel Mac at least according to Tom Cribben, who sent us a couple of screenshots. So we're gonna be doing more in-depth testing with encoding and we'll report back to you in the full M1 Mac Mini review. But I do wanna mention that Intel is known for having the best encoders and the M1's encoders could still be better than the current AMD encoders in machines like the Mac Pro. Now problem number six has to do with gaming, specifically iPhone and iPad game support which is brand new and exclusive to M1 Max. The problem is that basically all of the games that I was excited to play don't show up in the Mac App Store, like Call of Duty Mobile, for example. To get around that, I had to use iMazing to download and install the IPA file, and I was finally able to get a bunch of games to work, like simple games such as Clash Royale and Clash of Clans with no issues. However, games that are meant to be used with touchscreens like Brawl Stars don't work very well since you need both hands to move and to shoot. But thankfully, controller support was working perfectly in games like Call of Duty Mobile, but it's upsetting that some players are getting banned for some reason. I do want to mention that I'm using the latest developer beta of Big Sur, which allowed me to play those games in full screen, but it's still within the iPad aspect ratio, so it's not optimized. And sadly, most people don't have access to the developer beta, so they can't even use the apps in full screen until the new public version of Big Sur gets released. And to make it even worse, bootcamp support is now gone, which brings us into problem number seven. We no longer have a good way of playing popular Windows games like Call of Duty Warzone, Valorant, and Grand Theft Auto V. But games that were already on the Mac, like Diablo 3, League of Legends, and Minecraft run incredibly well under Rosetta 2, considering the M1 Macs use integrated graphics. And games already updated for Apple Silicon, like World of Warcraft, run even better, even getting decent FPS on the fanless M1 MacBook Air. However, running Windows games is not an easy task. I was able to play a few of them using Crossover for Mac, which emulates Windows, but Among Us and The Witcher 3 were the only two games that I tested that ran very well. Games like Warzone, Grand Theft Auto, and Cyberpunk 2077 wouldn't even turn on, so I had to resort to using GeForce Now game streaming, which wasn't perfect because of connectivity issues. And this brings us to problem number eight, Wi-Fi connection issues. These M1 Macs are the very first Macs with Wi-Fi 6 support, and it definitely shows since Max was able to get over 600 megabits per second download speed at his house, compared to around 300 on older Intel Macs. However, I did experience times when the Wi-Fi would just disconnect randomly, 
leading to browser pages showing no connection. I didn't have these issues in the past with Intel Max, so hopefully it's just a software bug in macOS Big Sur that Apple is working on solving very soon. Moving on to problem number nine, we experienced Bluetooth issues, just like a lot of people reported online. Max switched from his Mac Pro to the M1 Mac Mini, and he's been noticing occasional glitching or weirdness with Apple's Magic Mouse, which never happened before on the Mac Pro. I also noticed this happen myself while playing games with the MX Master Mouse. And now, let's finally finish off with problem number 10. These M1 Macs have been running incredibly cool compared to Intel Macs, especially for how much performance they're putting out. However, we've seen the temps reach as high as 92 degrees Celsius during heavy workloads. Now that isn't as bad as the old Intel Max that would easily hit 100 degrees Celsius 20 seconds after starting a Cinebench run, but the problem is that while the M1 Max start heating up, Apple is choosing to keep the fan speed very low to keep the machine silent. Now while that is pretty rare, I've seen the temps as high as 92 degrees while the fan speed was barely above idle, which could be a cause for concern for some people who aren't used to temps that high. But luckily, for those of you who aren't comfortable with that, there's an app called TG Fan Pro, which you can use to set your own automatic fan profile if you don't want it to run at temps that high. Now with all of those 10 problems out of the way, let me answer the original question. Is it still worth buying one of these new M1 Macs? Absolutely yes. We personally believe that the benefits of the M1 chip far outweigh these problems, since it seems like most of them can be fixed with future software updates. The day-to-day -day experience on these M1 Macs is so much better than any Intel Mac we've used before. Everything is faster, more reliable, and definitely more cool and quiet. And at this point, we would still recommend either buying an M1 Mac right now, or waiting for the M1X Macs, which are coming next year and hopefully by then, some of these software issues will be ironed out. In fact, the only Intel Mac that we would still recommend is the same Mac that we recommended three months ago, the 2020 5K iMac for $2,300. It's an excellent value due to the built-in 5K display, battery life isn't an issue, heat isn't an issue, and graphics performance is excellent. So if you wanna learn more details on why we're still recommending it, go ahead and watch our review of that iMac right over there. And if you learned something new from this video, click that circle above to subscribe for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.